you know, 2021, I tried running a Solana test validator locally, um, just using the CLI and it like took two seconds and the whole thing was confirmed. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that's the future right there. Payments on chain are probably worse than, uh, you know, payments on the internet before there was SSL. Right? It's like right now, if I send you money, if I send you some USDC, you basically have access to my whole on-chain financial history. And so that's, that's, that's just fundamentally super important that you need to have some privacy if you want to like serve these use cases. And our goal you know, was really to just create a proof of concept that it was possible to verify ZK Snacks on Solana. Thank you for joining me, Swen. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. I think you're building something super cool with the light protocol. Uh, so excited to jump into what you're building and kind of the entire vision that you and your co-founder have set out to build. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. Wonderful. Uh, I think the world as we're, is kind of shaping up in the blockchain landscape is two opposite ends of the spectrum. We have the monolithic chain kind of scales and one opinion and the other world opinion is modular is the way forward and modularity has some benefits. I think uh, particularly around the aspect of privacy and being able to incorporate some of those privacy features into a layer two or a layer three but I think what you're building is kind of a little bit not opposite of that, but kind of breaks that narrative and allowing you to build privacy into the layer one itself, specifically Solana, which is extremely cool. So definitely want to get into all the technical aspects, just kind of framing the conversation a little bit. But would love to get a quick intro about yourself. How did you start working on Lake Protocol? For sure, yeah. So uh, the long story is really... Um, my co-founder and I, um, my co-founder is named Joe. We are childhood friends. So like we've known each other since forever, since since we can sort of count, right? Like um, when the last bull run before this bull run, so like 2017, I don't know if you, you remember vividly, but I do. Um, that was I do as well. It was super exciting and 2018 sucked. So I remember it very vividly. Yeah, exactly. I had a, a sort of exactly the same experience, sort of, you know, 2017, just I was still in school, dabbling and in investing. Um, and Joe, my co-founder, introduced me to this whole space. In 2018, um, with the bear market, I got super, you know, frustrated and disillusioned. I was like, why do we need a blockchain anyway? What is it good for? And to my regret, I, uh, you know, started doing web stuff. And I'm saying regret, but, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to have been sort of collect a lot of experiences there, you know, basically building SaaS for small and medium sized German businesses, you know, worked on different projects and with different startups there um, for the last couple of years until 2021, um, when Jorrit, so Joe and I sort of uh, met again in Berlin. So we originally, we, we lived in Berlin and Germany at that time. And we were catching up, up on stuff. And he's actually been working, you know, since 2018, just interested in the crypto space. So he's uh, been doing his master's thesis on private voting. Um, and what he did was he, his idea was to basically just fork Tornado, which, you know, is this privacy protocol on ETH and make it run on Solana. Because like he's, you know, early 2021, Solana was like this, very interesting, challenging project. It, and, and it was still not consensus, like before the whole, you know, it was before the whole sort of crazy uh, pump in, in Seoul. And that was really interesting. And, and he was like, hey, do you want to help me build this thing uh, as a hobby project after I'm done um, writing the thesis ar around it? And, and at that time, you know, I didn't have any Rust knowledge, uh, but I was like, that sounds interesting. Um, and we just, you know, picked it up from there. I helped him a little bit. We got a grant from from American investors. That was essentially like this moment where it grew from this, like just a hobby project to actually something that, you know, could be an actual business or could be an actual, you know, protocol and, um, and sustainable. And uh, so we were very unfortunate, uh, very fortunate to, to get this, this grant, get this sort of validation from investors early on. Um, 
obviously great timing with the with the 2021 bull market um, yep. where everybody was crazy about uh, Solana. And, you know, we we worked on this thing full time. I don't know if you recall, but there was this Ignition Hackathon in fall 2021. And our goal, you know, was really to just create a proof of concept that it was possible to verify ZK Snarks on Solana. So ZK Snarks, right, is this... Um, quite proven, relatively speaking, uh, zero knowledge uh, tech where um, you can, you know, basically prove to someone else that your statement, whatever the statement is, is legit without revealing any information beyond that statement itself. And so, you know, you can picture there's like a lot of different use cases you can use this for, not just token transfers, which was what it was used for before that. Um, and and yeah, the proof of concept was really, okay, make it run on the constraint Solana runtime. Um, we did that and then sort of took off from there in a way where uh, we open sourced this whole thing in January, 2022, and then raised the seed round. Um, a great timing as well. Very fortunate to get awesome investors on board uh, just at the time where everything collapsed, right? And <laughs> the, the next bear market was knocking uh, on a door and, and, uh, that was, that was a qu crazy ride last year, but, um, yeah, that's where, where things really got started and that's how I got into it. Amazing. Uh, amazing backstory. I think, yeah, it, it was definitely, I would argue even today, Solana is still a non-consensus bet outside of like the core Solana's community to us at all kind of seems very obvious that, uh, this is what's going to bring forward <laughs> mainstream adoption, but yeah, yeah, even in 2020, uh, what I guess what got you excited about the Solana ecosystem at that point in time? Yeah, so great question. I mean, it was really that on Ethereum, if you try to build anything but just normal token transfers, like if you wanted to build, for instance, private governance or private voting um, with CK, like it's just so expensive and so slow. So like it's it's you're really limited on the range of use cases you can build with CK. Um, by definition, just because you inherit the, um, you know, the fee structure and the speed of the layer one that you're building on. And Solana was like this, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. And it was like amazing. I remember it, you know, com and, and comparing that to 2017 when I did my first ETH on chain transaction, right? 2017. And it took like 16 minutes and I had to figure out how to pay, like what gas fees to pay. And I went to the separate site and it was like this super complicated experience and then I tried, you know, 2021, I tried running a Solana test validator locally, um, just using the CLI and it like took two seconds and the whole thing was confirmed. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that's the future right there. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, we obviously also were super prompt by, I mean, it, it's interesting because um, what you're saying with uh, Solana is a non-consensus bet and I very much agree. Um, but you remember that moment, you know, in time in 2021, where like everybody was FOMOing about Solana. Like if you were telling investors, um, for instance, about like, oh, we're building this on Solana. It's like, okay, take my money. Um, <laughs> so it was like, there was like this brief moment in time where Solana was extremely this like FOMO coin um, up until, you know, 2022, obviously. Yeah, definitely. No, it's uh, once you use Ethereum, and then having used Solana, uh, the differences are night and day. And I think definitely when you look at it from a product perspective, I, I said this on a podcast the, a couple days ago that I think people now, especially in how amazing Web2 has gotten, it's fast. Uh, you don't pay for things, but the latency is super low. If the website takes longer than a second to load, normally you bounce. And I think in crypto, we've kind of just become accustomed to these very long block times to very long confirmations. But 99.99% .99 of the world has yet to be onboarded into crypto. And they expect these type of experiences. And so um, amazing that you recognize that as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think we're super early in terms of, you know, just blockchain tech. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty young. I wasn't necessarily around in like the 90s and like the early 2000s. But like, that's what I imagine, uh, you know, in terms of probably the same pattern. 
in terms of where tech was at that time. 100%. I, I kind of use the analogy from dial-up to broadband to fiber optics. And uh, I think blockchains are going through a sim- very similar path. But maybe transitioning a little bit. So the light protocol ultimately is allowing engineers, programmers to make private program execution. And you said that was really highlighted by the zero knowledge tech. Can you explain that or go into a little bit deeper on how that is possible? Uh, Because again, and kind of like the framing of the conversation, uh, a lot of crypto Twitter or even the community thinks it's impossible to do on the layer one. It has to be done on like a layer two or a layer three. For sure. And and there's some interesting um, nuances as well, where there are similarities to, um, you know, what people call L2s. Um, but, uh, and there's some differences and I'm happy to get into these. So I'll, I'll start with like sort of try to keep it brief, but like some high level overview of like how, you know, how is it even possible to, to have privacy um, on chain, right? So uh, basically, um, and, and maybe it makes even sense to like, you know, as first of all, like get into like, why is that even a problem? Yeah. Right? And like, t- take it and start it wherever you need. Yeah, for sure. So um, basically, if you have use cases like gaming, right? So I, I, I'm super excited about the gaming use case. But if you have use cases like gaming, um, if you want to build a multiplayer game, right? Like say Coop or Magic or Poker or any sort of, you know, round based trading card game on chain, you cannot do that on any public at layer one. You can't do that on ETH, you can't do that on Solana. Um, because players need to be able to commit to a hand, right? Without the other person, you know, being able to see their hand on chain. Otherwise, uh, you know, you'd, you'd always have cheaters in game because they could just look it up on chain. Um, and so that's where privacy is really, really important. And, and there's a bunch of other use cases like treasury management for companies, uh, payments, Right. Like you mentioned broadband as well around the same time, like payments on chain are probably worse than, uh, you know, payments on the Internet before there was SSL. Right. So right now, if I send you money, if I send you some USDC, you basically have access to my whole on chain financial history. And so that's 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 just fundamentally super important that you need to have some privacy if you want to like serve these use cases. You know, and then there are others like, you know, governance, private voting stock pool trading, these sort of things. Um, So yes, starting from this premise that, okay, we want to have all these nice mainstream use cases on Solana um, and Solana cannot serve them because, you know, you need, you need this uh, user data protection. And so there, if you, if you look at like how, you know, why does Solana not work is how does, why does Solana not support privacy natively is that first of all, state on Solana is unencrypted, right? So programs define their program logic on chain um, and transaction update that state transparently, right? That makes sense because that's also how with Solana consensus works, right? Like with any public blockchain, that's how validators get consensus because they can observe a given transaction and they can check, oh, you know, that transaction is all right. The account balances, um, you know, they, they change correctly. Um, the other thing that's problematic with regards to privacy on chain is that Solana, like Ethereum as well, has an account model for its state. So everything is an account on Solana. So for example, if I send you um, one USDC, right? Like Solana goes find go, goes and finds our token accounts uh, and updates the token account balances in place. So there's like this slot-based updating of state, um, which fundamentally leaks information about whose state is changing with any given transaction. So um, we have these two fundamental issues with regards to privacy on Solana. We have unencrypted state, and we have this account model that leaks information. Um, so you know, naturally, then you go and it's like, how do we solve these things? Um, and yeah. Are these more, I mean, Solana definitely has this problem. Ethereum is a similar state of affairs. Is this more just kind of a layer one problem uh, across the blockchain industry? Because I think, and we'll probably get into this in, later in the podcast, I think from a regulatory standpoint, these layer ones kind of have to be open, at least uh, from a base layer standpoint. Uh, and then you can add privacy on top of that. Is that kind of 
your point of view as well? Uh, that's an interesting angle with regards to regulatory. Um, in the end, um, it definitely helps layer one blockchains right now that everything's transparent in terms of like if there's law enforcement trying to you know trace a transaction or whatever. Um, if you and and I mean this is I think a whole like separate discussion about like yeah. the, the nonsense there. Um, you know, you, you could have this counter argument that, you know, in the European Union, for instance, you have GDPR, which is like every user should be in control of the data and applications should be able to, you know, need to ask for it, for the consent, the consent of the user before they collect the data, which is like layer one blockchains by default are like the nightmare for <laughs> GDPR. It's like all your data is collected and you have no say in it. Um, and no one can delete it either, you know, like there's, there's all that, um, that discussion around this, uh, regulatory wise, um, in terms of, um, your first question with regards to, is that, a, is that, you know, openness, um, a problem for all blockchains? It's there's, there's a couple nuances there. Like if you look at, um, you know, Solana and Ethereum, for instance, are all have this account model where you have account balances that update. Um, if you look at other blockchains like Bitcoin, for instance, um, and some of the sort of derivatives that um, you know derive from Bitcoin, it's actually uh, not an account model, uh, but a UTXO model. Which, fun fact, and we'll get into this, is also what we utilize. But it's essentially um, it's, it's a little bit more privacy preserving because you in the eventually um, essentially you have this append only chain of state updates. With Bitcoin, it's pretty simple because the state that's updating is just account balances like you you know natively at least you cannot build um dApps on it um but in essence is you know you have these this chain of things you don't have these state updates in specific slots anymore so you have a little bit more privacy and you and, and bitcoin clients also you can have different settings for uh how private you want to have it but then again it's like it's not zk privacy so it's 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 not the whole thing um so there's a couple of nuances there um in essence, usually consensus is based around the idea of like everybody's able to verify transparent state, but it's not necessarily tied to layer ones. Um, there are other layer ones, like um, I don't know if you've heard of Secret Network. Yep. Yeah, it's essentially a layer one that's um, you know that utilizes like validators basically have this like trusted element in their hardware where that's where they decrypt um, transaction state. Um, and are able to, uh, you know, actually see what's going on, and the outside actually it's all encrypted state. So it's like it's not necessarily tied to to L1. Interesting. Well, and I kind of cut you off, so maybe getting back on track. So you, you kind of outlined these two specific problems in the account-based world where these blockchains on the layer one have these issues, which ultimately can prevent or make it more difficult from the privacy aspect, but Light, Light Protocol, ultimately, in the team that you've created has found a solution for this. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it's it's actually pretty straightforward, right? Like if you, uh, and, and you know, I can't even reference all the other smart minds who've, who've sort of, you know, figured this out on a, on a research and theoretical level and implemented this on uh, on ETH, for instance. But um, yeah, there, you know, as you said, like two fundamental questions, like, first of all, like how do we update private state on shame without revealing clues about which state was updated by whom. And then second, like how do validators actually validate state transitions uh, in a manner that lets, you know, them agree that the state transition was, was legit, even if it's encrypted. So um, yeah, uh, you know, the first question is really um, let's find a different model, right? Like let's not, let's not stick to the account model. Let's find the UTXO model. And, and I'll explain it briefly. It's basically that, um, Instead of, and I mentioned it just before as well, right? Instead of mutating account variables, like for instance, an account balance, but this could be anything. Uh, instead of mutating that in place, we just encrypt state in the client and send it on chain and append it to this state list of, you know, as a linearly growing list append only of new encrypted state. So, you know, we're simply adding to the whole state concealing which past state was amended, was basically updated with a new transaction, right? So, um, you know, this this approach, as I said, right, resembles a little bit how, how Bitcoin does it, but with the nuance that the state that we're updating is encrypted. Um, so, yeah, so the- Is it expensive yeah. to do the encryption on chain? Uh, the encryption, 
No, it's actually, there's no difference in terms of um, the encryption happens off chain. So basically um, how that works is that users each have a decryption key, right? If you have a Lights protocol account, which derives from your wallet, for instance, um, you have a decryption key. So now um, each of the state that you have, for instance, your private balance, right? You decrypt that in the client. Um, you create a state transition, and we'll get into it, uh, sort of how that works uh, in a little bit. But you you encrypt the state transition, you generate a proof, and this zk proof, you know, that's what you send on chain. Um, the state is sent on chain in, in an encrypted way. So that's just you know the blockchain doesn't care. That's like just that's just you know bytes uh, in, yep. instead of transparent. They're encrypted, so there's no extra cost there. Um, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. And so in the encryption process, you encrypt it off chain, the light protocol wallet allows you to decrypt that. And oh, by the way, I think I, I don't hear you anymore. Hello? Am I, Still am I frozen? You. Can you hear me now? Now it works again. Interesting. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, no worries. So the encryption happens off chain. You're then adding it to the protocol, the protocol is kind of agnostic to the data that it's sending across the network. So it's fairly easy to send the encrypted data. It's an append only. So you're making sure that you're encrypting new data on top of the old data. Yeah, exactly. So you're just appending to that list. And so when you are, for instance, uh, deleting a variable, you're not actually updating or overwriting the old state, you're just appending new state and it's encrypted. So no one knows if you know what other old state that new state is overriding, so that's uh, that's essentially that's the essence of it. And then you know you have new questions like, okay, so first of all, um, how how do I handle these you know state updates on the client? And then second of all, how if it's all encrypted, how do we then verify it on chain that you know where Solana we still have the same security properties that Solana has? Yeah. So I mean, yeah, we'd we'll, we'll love to dive deeper dive deeper into both of those. For sure, yeah. So basically, um, for context, every light transaction emits new UTXOs. UTXOs being, you know, that's short for unspent transaction output, and you might know it from something like Bitcoin. That's how how they assemble, for instance, Bitcoin balances. It's just a collection of different UTXOs that you own as the user. Um, so yeah, each of chunks of this new encrypted state uh, is what we call uh, a UTXO, and each UTXO um, this Again, for instance, could be uh, you know one soul could you know that could be represented as state. Uh, each of these UTXOs has a nullifier uh, and a commitment, and a nullifier is basically representing that um, it's the UTXO spent. So if the nullifier is inserted on chain, we know this UTXO was spent, uh, and the commitment of the UTXO just validates the UTXO. So when we create this UTXO as an output of a transaction and send it encrypted on chain, um, we're actually also inserting a commitment of that UTXO into a global, large, large global Merkle tree on chain. Um, and, you know, just importantly, the, it's important to note that the nullify and the commitment, they are derived from the UTXO in a way that when you look at it on chain, you cannot tell which UTXO that, you, that was on chain they belong to. Um, unless you own the actual UTXO, because then you can obviously derive the whole UTXO, uh, including the nullifiers and the, and the commitment. So for example, right, say, say you want to send one USDC through Light Protocol. What you're actually doing is you're invalidating your preceding UTXO in the client, which confirms your ownership of one USDC, and you emit a new UTXO, output UTXO, which is then encrypted to the recipient's uh, public key, like in this case, light light account, um, and then this new encrypted UTXOs UTXO is is appended on chain, right? So like now, uh, if you are the recipient Logan, you can then go and you know scan the chain and see now you have this UTXO, which basically means that now your your this one UCC has shifted hands from me to you uh, without any on chain token movement, right? All that's visible on chain is that there's a new um, addition of you know a few encrypted bytes um, to a growing list of encrypted UTXOs, and you know in doing so, uh, Light Protocol essentially extends this you know UTXO model that we know from Bitcoin um, to Solana, and so basically you know that's that's how all the details of on-chain operations remain private. 
because you know state is encrypted and the state updates don't happen in place anymore. Um, interesting. Very yeah. interesting. When, when does so and then the verification process on chain? At what point does that take process? Yeah, for sure. So um, that yeah, exactly. That's the natural next question, right? So like um, you compute your state off chain in the client. Um, you generate a proof because basically what happens is, um, and and the difference there to to conventional Solana uh, programs is that, and I'll pedal back a little bit. So if you have a Solana program, it's almost always just an escrow over tokens with some unique constraints, right? So like you can, if you abstract Solana programs or any smart contract down enough, like that's essentially what it is. So now the 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 trick is that um, you can take this logic and move it from the Solana program to the client. And you do that by using so-called ZK circuits, right? So a ZK circuit is just like the set of rules, a circuit, um, for when you create, when the client creates a zero knowledge proof, right? So now this proof encodes um, this program logic that you moved off chain. So we create this proof and we send that on chain. And, and we do that, you know, that's basically, we create the proof, um, with the UTXOs that we have at hand, obviously, you know, before that we need to decrypt them. So there's a lot you can do in terms of like performance there, um, a lot of optimization, but you create the proof, the proof generation, you know, let's say if you have a normal token transfer, proof generation takes like 0 0.5 to, you know, two seconds on your um, device, depending on your device. Um, and then you send a transaction on chain. And with version three of like protocol, which is what we, you know, launched on testnet, uh, I think, two weeks ago, um, sorry, um, uh, you can basically uh, verify that in one transaction. So it's like one transaction, you generate the proof, you send it on chain, it's verified, and everything happens happens there. So um, when the proof is created client side, so on your personal computer, you create that proof, and then you send it to the network. Does the power of one's personal computer ultimately affect how long it will take to generate the proofs? Or are these proofs relatively s simplistic enough that pretty much anybody's hardware can run these? Um, so when I, great question. And it depends on the power of your device. Um, if I say uh, 0 0.5 to 2 seconds, that's using just, you know, conventional, you know, hardware. Um, like, you know, I'm using a Mac, for instance, so that's a little bit faster. So I'm like, you know, at 0 0.6, 0 0.8 in a browser. And then if I'm in like a node environment, that's even faster. Like, I think uh, what we benchmarked just using some, you know, library that, that I found on chain, that was a C++ prover. So uh, actually quite fast. It was like between 100 and 300 milliseconds on, mm -hmm. on my computer. So you know, and there's there's a lot of research and development that goes into into that field, and and it's obviously a very important field once we solve all the other um, performance issues. So like um, with the three, it was mostly a focus on like, oh, let's get this into one transaction on chain, the whole verification part, which is also computationally heavy, um, and happy to you know dive into that um, and how we make that possible. But um, yeah, proof generation is definitely definitely in. Uh, exciting field for optimization as well and yeah, then right. yeah then sorry and then uh depending on the complexity of your program logic that also makes doesn't have an impact right so like if you have normal token transfer it's quite quick quite snappy um but if you want to for instance um build a private nft trading platform it's a little bit um more expensive computationally so it takes a little bit longer very interesting. I, yeah, the zero knowledge field is one of definitely a hot topic in the blockchain world. And I'm sure the advancements that are being made there will only continue to accelerate. Do you feel like, in your personal opinion, more client side operations will start to happen in the blockchain world? Um, yeah, that's a cool question. Um, there are people that you know who argue that everything will be client side, um, and I think that I mean obviously for there's there's an interesting angle to this where you don't necessarily need to compute everything on the client um, proof wise if if you build something with zk, um, and then you know if you look at zk VMs or um, you know zk solutions on on Ethereum that you know are you also need to solve scalability. Um, 
they have usually, especially ZKVMs, they have huge proofs. Um, they have, you know, there's a lot of computation that's going on there. So they're working with like recursion and these sort of things and sequencers, um, which are basically just web servers um, to, to, to handle all these things. So there's like, there's a lot of, there's probably an infinite amount of complexity that you can, that you can unfold there. Um, I think for something like Solana and like protocol, I mean, obviously I'm a little bit biased. Um, you know, <laughs> two things, obviously one, I think that Solana is going to be one, if not the major blockchain in the next couple of years, just for, uh, you know, mainstream applications to build on. And second of all, I think that like protocol, uh, will be quite successful in, in how it facilitates the whole privacy, uh, parts of it. I don't think that everything, hundred percent of traffic will be private. And I don't think that's needed because uh, there are use cases where, you know, transparency and, and public state make a lot of sense. Even if you look at these private applications where I'm like personally really excited about like on-chain games or let's say NFT trading, um, you still want to have some, pro some public state uh, in combination with private state uh, just because you need to have shared state. So for an NFT trading, right? Like that would be, for instance, a an listing of an NFT. You want everybody to see that there's a listing. You just don't want everybody to see that the trade was executed or at what price it was sold uh, and who was involved. So this, it's going to be that hybrid model. Yeah, I do agree as well. I think that hybrid model and is the path forward, especially if you can do it on the layer one. I think that makes it very unique in the sense that you're not fragmenting liquidity. You don't have to understand which kind of L2 or world you're in. You don't have to worry about shared sequencers, all the benefits that we kind of love of a single shard high throughput blockchain we get, plus the privacy aspect that light protocol is creating. Yeah, for sure. And um, there's some interesting thing you said with regards to liquidity, and that's where maybe it makes sense to um, look a little bit at sort of similarities to, you know, if you build a ZKVM or layer two is like one of the fundamental properties is that you have um, that, that you have a new liquidity silo, right, that you spin up and you have a bridge to that layer two. Um, while we're on Solana itself, meaning that we don't, don't batch and we don't roll up, um, so, you know, it's just like that instant settlement. Technically, you still, and that's, uh, that's obviously one of these trade-offs, you still have a liquidity silo. And I'll, I'll tell you where. It's basically once you move your funds, right? Like let's say you have a public Solana address or token balance, um, you need to somehow inform like protocol that you want to have this as a private balance, right? So what happens is, you are basically shielding, that's what we call it, shielding your tokens from this public address into your private balance. And what happens under the hood is that um, you put it in an escrow, right? So there's this like global liquidity pool um, that we call light liquidity pool. And if you zoom out enough, it might look like just, you know, like with another layer one or layer two, um, that's, you know, that's where the liquidity lies. And then we put that abstract, that UTXO abstraction on top where then you don't have any token movements anymore and you just exchange ownership over, over these UTXOs. So there's still this like tricky question of um, liquidity fragmentation, in, if you will. Um, it's just that with Light Protocol, it's probably the closest it can be to uh, a layer one itself. And, you know, it's like this real time thing. You can like switch between the two states in within like one one transaction. And is that kind of separate pool of liquidity ultimately needed because you have to enable the UTXOs? Yeah, exactly. So that's that's exactly it, right? Like you, you the, the protocol needs to know uh, what is representing these UTXOs and, and in the end it's linked to some token. Unless and and this is also an interesting field, but you know obviously um, just part of Light Protocol is you could, um, not with the current version, but like that's one feature that um, might be interesting to build into it, um, is minting private tokens, right? So like you mint, you just mint these UTXOs. Obviously, there needs to be uh, very well thought out in terms of like you sh should not be able to, you know, uh, burn these UTXOs then to mint uh, real Solana tokens or something like that. So, you, you know, this, this is a more complicated feature technically, 
but um, definitely possible. And then you don't have that bridge, but you still have that you know native light protocol um, liquidity, if you will. Interesting. So let, maybe if I could just kind of re-articulate most of the path, and if I'm wrong, please correct me. So if I want to kind of do a private transaction on Light Protocol, I send, say, for example, one USDC to Light Protocol that is it starts in a public address that g- then gets moved moved to a private address or shielded address. And that is now in a uh, escrowed in the Light Protocol um, software where you can then utilize UTXOs. From there, if I want to, uh, while it's in a UTXO, it gets encrypted. Uh, you can then send these transactions or these, tr- the encryption happens on the client side. So on your personal computer, you can then send that gets sent to another person that's still encrypted, but you submit the proof back down to the layer one, so, so Solana, um, and that entire transaction sequence from end to end is private, and then you submit the proof on uh, the layer one, and that layer one is showing the encrypted proof saying that the transfer happened, so you could go through the entire consensus. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well put. Okay. Um, and... Yeah, I think there's there's nothing to add really. Obviously, we could you know endlessly dive into uh, specifics and details, but yeah, that's 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 uh, all about you. So, given, I mean, so with the escrow, your if I send the one USDC to Light Protocol, uh, the way that you're tracking that balance because all the funds are kind of in this new silo is kind of just through the, um, I'd say, smart contract saying that I have moved my money from my account to this new account. Um, yeah, so you mean if you start, if you shield it uh, initially or? So ultimately, I'm, I'm, I guess my high level question is, once I move my money into a shielded account on Light Protocol, and those kind of technically assets are with other assets, how are you doing or Light Protocol doing the tracking of those assets in that new pool? Right. Yeah. So um, Light Protocol itself, um, just like anyone else, except the, the user that owns the UTXOs, right, doesn't know uh, which part of this like global liquidity pool, which is essentially just a token account, right, um, belongs to whom. Like it doesn't know the specifics. Uh, what happens is that once you shield initially, um, you transfer it from your public Solana balance to this, you know, token PDA uh, on chain, and in exchange, uh, you get this ownership note, right? Like a UTXO that says so and so owns the the person that o- that is able to decrypt this UTXO locally uh, owns one USDC, for instance, right? And then you can basically when you exchange tokens, then or you have an NFT that you shield it, and so you want to move it into, you know, into NFT trading or whatever. Um, you're basically just working with these UTXOs, not with the actual token anymore. And then, if you eventually want to unshield, right? So you want to move your tokens out of Light Protocol into regular Solana addresses. Um, then it's just a reverse process, right? So the UTXO gets spent, and in exchange, the tokens get withdrawn from this PDA. Interesting. No, it, it makes sense. Um, I guess in this kind of scenario, do you see maybe even on Ethereum or just the layer two landscape in general, do you see UTXOs becoming a more dominant kind of account model than just purely accounts? Great question. So uh, I just recently saw that there there was, I mean, there's always new projects um, popping up that, um, want to introduce privacy and and there are some really exciting ones i think that if projects like for instance aztec network right like aztec network is um, basically building a they don't call it zkvm but it's a scaling solution that also has built-in privacy um layer two to to ethereum and they're utilizing uh, their tech is extremely similar to what we're building um just that you know with the difference that with Solana, we inherit the scalability and speed of Solana, so we, we're 
very lucky. We don't need to build the whole scaling, which is ex extremely hard, obviously. Um, we don't need to build that. We can just focus on privacy. But if solutions like ASEC, um, you know, eventually launch, um, and, uh, and in fact, they, you know, first iterations they've already launched, you know, one or two years ago, I think was their first iteration. That's already utilizing this UTXO model. So um, I think just like with Solana, there's definitely that space for UTXOs. Just because UTXOs have these nice privacy-preserving properties, um, there's definitely that space. Um, a whole different question then is, okay, will Ethereum serve, uh, you know, m a significant amount of mainstream applications where users actually care about privacy? Um, that's, that's, I think that's a different question. And like my personal, you know, biased answer is that, um, that that will not necessarily be the case, but yeah, that's, that's a separate one. Yeah. In your point of view, I would say just being more close to the zero knowledge side of the world, how these proofs get created. What is your thoughts on the technology being used for scaling specifically? Yeah. I mean, um, I think it's super exciting. Obviously, I mean, I, unfortunately, I don't, you know, I don't spend too much time on like going deep into the specifics um, just because like what we're doing is already like so all encompassing in terms of <laughs> focus. But um, there's some really interesting tech that can also then, you know, potentially be applied to to just for privacy on Solana or, um, you know, if it ever happens, if, you know, technically layer twos are, you know, you can build a layer two on Solana as well. It's just right now, there's definitely no need for it at all because Solana has a lot of block space and it's scheduled hardware. So like if there's ever more demand than block space, I think uh, when I asked Anatoly that question, his answer was just like two words or essentially just like, yeah, more block space. They'll just, you know, increase the hardware, hardware requirements for validators. Um, so if, you know, so I don't think layer two scaling um, is that interesting for Solana yet. Um, I think there are some people building something, something in that realm on Solana, or at least trying to bring Solana scalability to like Cosmos um, with with zk. So that's that's interesting. Um, but yeah, there's some there's some really ele interesting elements of that on on ETH, right? Um, where there's not only snarks, um, snarks. The, the cool thing about zk snarks is, and I won't go into too much into the, the the details there. But the cool thing about snarks is. And ultimately, why we chose it as well for Light Protocol and Solana is that they're extremely small proofs, right? So they fit into, they're, they're, they're less, I think they're like 800 bytes or even less um, for these proofs. And they're succinct, which means that they don't, the proof size doesn't actually grow um, with ongoing complexity. So what that means is we can actually stuff these uh, bytes into a single Solana transaction, um, which, you know, Solana transaction has like, you know, slightly more than one kilobyte um, byte limit right now, uh, just in terms of size. And there are other proofs though that have other cool properties, like you know, faster verification time, or you know, just other cool things. I, you know, there's Starks, which you know, obviously built by Stark, Starknet, um, and Starkware. Um, I think you even talked with with their team on on your podcast as well before. Yep. Um, yep. Extremely smart engineers and researchers. And the the thing on like about why we can't use stocks is they have cool properties, but the one drawback is their proof size is in the kilobytes. So like they have huge proofs, and so um, not feasible for Solana, but definitely feasible for you know Starknet or other layer ones. Very interesting. Uh, maybe shifting a little bit back to Light Protocol, what are some of the things that you envision engineers on Solana? using it for uh i think the term you guys are kind of corning is the private solana programs uh can you talk a little bit about that as well yeah for sure um that's what i'm really excited about actually is like we've built this primitive that allows you to build privacy you know program logic um that, that is private um and state transition that is private and yes we coined it private solana programs because i think it's it's quite catchy and it sort of shows a little what's what's possible it's like uh, there, uh, I think I highlighted it a little bit in the beginning, but um, personally, I'm super excited about gaming just in terms of that if in combination with mobile, gaming is like this design space where you can really, like it's not hard to imagine, uh, you know, mainstream adoption with some on-chain game. 
um, especially because with mobile gaming, there's just like this huge distribution. If if we ever figure out how to, if if Solana apps ever you know figure out how to uh, reliably get on the Apple App Store, um, <laughs> that might be a, that might be one of the distribution challenges there. But um, super exciting. And then you know on chain games, if you put them wholly on chain, uh, you need privacy, you need CK, um, and uh, we've been talking to a, a couple of uh, individual developers already um, with regards to gaming, and they're like super excited about building trading card games on chain. Um, so, so I think that's what I'm really looking forward to. Um, and then there's, you know, and maybe that's a little bit of a hot take, but like it, one thing that to me makes a shit ton of sense is payments, right? Like that's what Bitcoin was built for in the beginning. It was like payments, like super lame use case, but like. I think that while, at least on Solana, this market is basically non-existent right now, um, I think that is one of the biggest, like, highest potential markets to emerge in the next, you know, hopefully couple I mean, of years. Just looking across all blockchains, I think arguably the most clear use case is payments. Uh, um, it's kind of funny, just after all this time, payments in like simple transfers of like USDC across the world is probably the best thing that we've come up with but especially on high throughput blockchains like solana the fees to send it are fractions of a penny and obviously it makes sense if you could encrypt that in some form or fashion i'm sure most people would opt into it as you said even with treasury management salaries there's a lot of use cases that make sense to have that privacy preserving aspect included (laughs) <laughs> and I can definitely envision a lot of people leaning into what you're building. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, there's these two th- like themes, right? Like there's the, what is happening with Web2 right now? Um, for instance, payments that we can translate really well with blockchain and into blockchain. Um, and, and that's where I'm like, okay, payments is really like, that's that's an actual need for people. That's an actual use case. Like merchants save so much money if they use Solana there's, I think there's like a couple iteration steps on how do you get people onboarded to wallets and then obviously regulatory uh, questions that sort of just stand in a way. And I, and I am f- super, like super, super certain, very convinced that in the next couple of years that will go away. And, and then you have blockchains like Solana where they really shine, as you said, right? Like super cheap, super fast. Like that's what you need. Like, I think it's harder to imagine you know, Bitcoin or if they are one to be used as uh, the payment pipes and rails for, of, of the, the next, you know, visas and MasterCards. Um, so, so that's one thing. And then with regards to like new use cases that are enabled by blockchain that we can't even like that don't exist in Web2, right? Like that's where I think, um, I mean, by def- definition, it's really hard to imagine these use cases. Um, a priori, right? Like it's it's extremely hard. Um, but I can imagine that, you know, with games, like obviously there are games um, and there will always be games, but like maybe there's some new, especially with like tokenization, but, and like, how do you, you organize, uh, you know, groups and, and DAOs and these sort of things. Like, I think that in gaming, there's like this whole new canvas of things that, you know, the new generation of developers can can dream up. And uh, yeah, that's really what, what excites me there. It's remarkable that one hit game on blockchains today would ultimately surpass all kind of active addresses ever in crypto. And I think that only highlights how early we truly are. But I definitely echo all your statements. I think what you're building is really going to push the space forward and thinking about privacy a little bit more. But also, again, as we were talking about on the the high throughput chains that are very cheap, that are easy to use. It just makes that entire experience just a little bit more seamless. So uh, kudos to you for picking a high throughput chain. I think uh, that's going to be more and more kind of a non-negotiation for engineers. I think that's going to be the de facto going forward. I think it'll just take a little bit of time. But in terms of like where you are at adoption, I think you said you're at V3 or ultimately going to be close to V3. Where is the product stand today? Can people use it? And if so, how so? Yeah, great question. So um, V3 is this whole thing around private Solana programs, right? Like basically... Um, 
taking the idea of what we have online. So, so what's online on mainnet right now uh, and has been for over a year is what we call V1, right? So we sort of like skipped V2 just because. Um, so V1 is just, you know, like Zcash on Solana. It's like token transfers and you can go in and out and you can transfer privately. Um, and with, so that's on mainnet. And, and people are using it. I mean, it's this quite niche market of people using it to fund their burner wallets privately, right? To then go and do Jupyter swaps or buy NFTs privately. Um, so that's that's the users that we have right now. Um, and then with the three, that's on testnet right now. So we've spun up our own testnet, uh, which runs on you know Kubernetes. Kubernetes is like basically a Solana test validator running on, on Kubernetes. Um, we spun up the testnet and people can build with it. Like it's, uh, you know, we have a CLI and SDK and people can go um, check out the docs. There's one or two guides. They can, you know, start dabbling with, with building a private Solana program. And that's where a lot of our engineering effort right now is also going into, you know, like listening to some of the user feedback um, and working with some of our, you know, partners to, to bring some of these integrations and apps to, to life. And, yeah, I, I hope. I mean, the the actual the launch on mainnet is limited by one thing mostly, which is that the Solana runtime um, needs to still activate a feature that we've built um, end of last year, um, which is a precompile for the zk snog verification on chain. So that's how, and that's how this heavy computation is essentially packed into one single instruction. Is like. You know, I think roughly 200,000 compute units um, and a single transaction can have like a million or a million point four um, compute units. And so we've built this precompile. Uh, it's merged and it's in that list of, you know, feature activations for mainnet um, and public devnet. And I hope personally, I mean, we're obviously lobbying for, you know, in, you know getting that activated ASAP. Um, but yeah, I hope that, you know, by the end of the summer, it's live. And then hopefully we'll have a bunch of integrations already, you know, at the start. So the proposal is already approved. It's just waiting to get integrated into mainnet or it's up for approval, still needs to get approved and then merged into mainnet. Yeah. So the process is that um, you have these PRs that you can make because you know, thankfully Solana is open source. Um, and uh, it's been reviewed, it's been merged into the, the master branch and it's already cut for the release 116, which um, is currently, I think they're just starting to put it on testnet now. Um, and yeah, it's part of the code base and then it's really just activating the feature. Um, but, you know, it's this, it's this process given, you know, given the recent Solana outage, uh, things have been uh, slower than, than anticipated, but um, yeah, so sometime hopefully by the end of summer we'll have it. Perfect. Well, I'm glad that it's merged and going into testnet. Uh, good things to come then shortly. Cool. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Uh, well, definitely appreciate you walking us through all this one. Uh, I appreciate the technical nuance, but ultimately what it will enable for people that are using Solana. Having private transactions, uh, I think, is something that we've been accustomed to in the Web2 world. But with open permissionless ledgers, everyone needing, needing to verify the state of the chain and how things work, we've kind of started back at square one. And we're leaning towards people like you and your co-founder and the Light Protocol to rebuild some of these primitives we've been accustomed to. And it's taken a little bit of time, but extremely excited for what you're building and how you're pushing this space forward. I'm sure a lot of people will ultimately adopt this technology. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. Um, well put. And I mean, you know, there's, there's this whole new angle of like, okay, then how, well, that's the technological side that we've mainly discussed, right? Like then how do you think about go to market and like, actually getting people on board it to uh, like protocol or any of those CK layers eventually. Um, and I mean, you know, that, that's a whole different, different topic to discuss. Um, but uh, yeah, great. Any, uh, maybe like a quick one or two minute spiel on how you are thinking about the go to market. Um, 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, we thought about this a lot because like, um, by definition, the, I mean, if you, you, the goal eventually, right, is you want to be embedded into the ecosystem. You want to make sure that all wallets, um, you know, all block explorers support your, your infrastructure. Um, and, and that goes for many, not only Light Protocol, like it goes for many infrastructure providers and protocols. Um, but with Light Protocol, obviously, that's very important because um, privacy is there's this, you know, I've written this uh, blog post over a year ago about like UX and privacy. And as you can see in like Web2, people really, really happily, um, you know, uh, say, well, you know, Google collects more data about me than DuckDuckGo, for instance, but it's it's much more convenient to use it, better results and so on and so forth. Now, arguably with, you know, open AI and ChatGPT, you could say that ChatGPT is even more convenient, um, but the, the essence is the same. It's like you need great UX for things like privacy to be adopted. And so there's, and then you have this sort of spectrum as well between, you know, you have use cases where people go will, will go through some pain to to achieve privacy right if you have like an nft whale and they want to sell or buy like a huge portion of uh, nfts without disrupting the market now they need an option to do that privately so they have this like very specific use case um, and they will pay for it and they will go through one or two steps and then you have on the other end you have this like i don't know regular payments right you don't even want to like you just want to go to your wallet. You want to click send, and if it's private, you know, like with SSL encryption nowadays, uh, that's cool. But I don't know if you remember, like browsers, like ten years ago, SSL was not a default, and so you had to like, you know, install manual stuff, and like SSL was slow as hell. It's like it was actually more convenient to not use SSL, and and so you need to reach a threshold with privacy um, in terms of just technological, but then also accessibility. Um, now I think with V3, we've reached, we've basically reached a technological threshold of like now it's extremely fast, extremely cheap, just as cheap as a regular Solana transaction. Um, because we're using compressed accounts. That's, there's a whole new thing of, uh, where there was a lot of buzz recently. Um, so we've reached that technological angle. Now it's about accessibility, right? Like you need to work with the, the, the wallets to, basically integrate privacy at the very, very base level of like key management even. Um, that's what I'm excited about. And as we roll this out, it's like, you know, working with some of these, some of these providers. Yeah. And again, I, I think ultimately this highlights kind of the single shard thesis being able to be integrated into all the block explorers on a single shard, uh, kind of being a unified standard instead of having, hundreds or millions of different roll-ups with their own different yep. standards, their different set of uh, UI, their different block explorers. So again, uh, no, it's very interesting. I think you picked uh, a beautiful place to build and I'm very excited for people to adopt what you have built as well. So again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast when uh, I wish you and the Light Protocol team all the best. I, I know you guys are going to kill it. So thank you. Thanks, Logan. It was great to, to talk.